Uh, my talk is called Starting Security, and it's specifically for starting security at a startup, introducing security to a startup. Um, I have a, it's pretty specific to SaaS companies, software as a service companies. The talk should be around 40 minutes. It should be run a little bit short. Feel free to ask questions, jump in, raise your hand, I'll call on you and you can shout at me and I'll repeat the question. Feel free to use the restroom, get up, throw schmoo balls at me if you have any leftover from last week. Uh, so let's get started. Who am I? I am Evan Johnson. I am a security engineer first and foremost. I've worked only at startups uh, and I don't have a CISSP. Um, <laughs> it, it feels like Alcoholics Anonymous is a little bit. It's like, a, I'm Evan Johnson and I don't have a CISSP. Um, I worked, my first job out of college was I worked at LastPass, the password manager, and they were purchased in 2015 uh, for $125 million by Logmian. When I, uh, I worked there on a team fewer than 10 engineers uh, working on the entire product from like the Chrome extension, Firefox extension, back end, front end, everything. Uh, and LastPass was a super interesting company. It's uh, one of the few security companies that's both B2B and B2C. They kill it with everybody from like, Facebook was a customer and my mom was a customer, uh, even before I worked there. So it's a really wide user base. So it was, they don't have a super stellar security record, but they're really interesting uh, to like work at and learn, learn from. Uh, I worked at Segment as well. I was the first security engineer at Segment. It's, uh, uh, there's been several speakers from Segment here. I think Colleen and Leaf spoke earlier today. David speaking tomorrow, and they were all, all super awesome content. I joined as the first security engineer, and they're on a tear still. I'm uh, no longer there, but they're, uh, they've done a ton, and they're a great team. Um, and I currently work at Cloudflare, where I also joined as the first security engineer. And uh, I was hired back in 2015. Uh, and it's a neat company to work at because it is a security product and it's a SaaS business. And being on the security team for a security product is pretty interesting. Um, and then, but first and foremost, I'm a security engineer. Uh, what is where I work, Cloudflare? Um, a lot of these experiences are from, I've, uh, from things I've learned working at Cloudflare and introducing security there. It's a giant reverse proxy. All of these numbers are old. We, uh, some of them are like orders of magnitude smaller than they are now. 10% uh, of internet requests every day. We see 10 million requests per second, 2.5 monthly unique visitors, six, more than 6 million websites. Uh, and uh, I know we have 165 or more data centers now. So 100 is way old. Um, so we're a giant reverse proxy, and we have really interesting security problems because of that. Uh, but what is this talk? I want, if you joined a startup tomorrow, I'd like you to be able to reference this talk and take some ideas to formulate what you, uh, how you introduce security there. So it's kind of a playbook for introducing security, a bare minimum uh, for how you do that. You won't build Google Project Zero in a year, and you won't build it in five years. But you can uh, start with the little things. And I, uh, one thing that a lot of people say at a lot of different security talks is, security is everybody's job. You have to work with developers. Um, but actually doing that and how to approach doing that and being the first impression for developers and the rest of the company uh, I'm, I'm hoping I can help with that. Um, okay, so what is a security team? Starting with what a security team does. I found this when I Googled CISO job or Chief Information Security Officer job and I clicked images. This was paid for by the United States Postal Service. So this is like several million dollars worth of clip art here. Uh, so the role of a CISO is protect, shield, defend, prevent, Monitor, hunt, detect, respond, recover, sustain, govern, manage, comply, educate, manage risk. And then in an actual security org, it looks something like this. Uh, nobody can actually see this slide, and that's kind of the point. But this is in the middle, that little green ellipse egg shape is the CISO, and under that is all of the functions of a security team uh, according to 
Rafiq Rahman uh, and cited down there. It's a great image of all of the uh, functions of a CISO. There's just listing some here, legal and HR resources, risk management, a whole team for selling InfoSec internally, governance, identity, management, uh, that's huge, especially in a big company. Security operations, responding to incidents, monitoring, alerting. Um, budget, that's a whole team here. If you, It must be a really big company if you have a whole team dedicated to your security budget. Project delivery life cycle, security architecture, making sure that you don't have treasure trove of financial data sitting directly behind a server with an Apache Struts vulnerability, uh, which sounds familiar. Compliance and audits, uh, super important in B2B, but also B2C, complying with new privacy laws. This whole thing is super foreign to me since I've only worked at startups. I had to ask um, in a group hacker chat I'm in, like, has anybody worked at really big companies? What's it like? Uh, at a startup, you might have five people on your security team filling out 20 different functions on this. And uh, some, some more that came up that's not on here that I heard from people in my uh, hacker chat I just referenced. Uh, technical program managers become really important when, you're, when your team reaches a certain size since security is, uh, works with every piece of the company. Being able to have security work with different parts of the company really smoothly is important. Threat intel is a big one that's in the industry right now, which is just data science in the security org. If you have uh, security-like data, data science is threat intel. Uh, fraud, fraud and abuse, if you're like PayPal or um, Stripe, you might have really interesting fraud and abuse problems financial um, on the financial side, but um, I've never experienced too much of that. Okay, security specifically at a SaaS business, it's kind of like broken into four different areas for me. Production, corporate, business operations, and unexpected. Uh, and then I have my definition for sec what securing even means down there. I stole it from the, uh, from the CISO slide, the clip art slide. Um, and production, um, a lot of SaaS companies are super engineering first, and this gets a lot of attention, which is good, I think. Uh, but it's not everything. You can't focus only on production. There, uh, especially in an engineering first culture, you have your AppSec team, you have your infrastructure security team, you have your cloud security team, or whatever other engineering functions you need. If you have like bird scooters, you might have like a scooter security team, I don't know. But uh, SaaS businesses will have like a special focus on the production side of things. Corporate security, um, making sure that you, whether you have 100 or 100,000 employees, securing where people work, their workplace, uh, their onboarding and offboarding experience, their, uh, the list is really long with corporate. Their, the business's operations uh, is mentioned here, and then the unexpected. Security people get pulled into really unexpected things, I think, when you're at a startup. I've been pulled into really sensitive HR issues that have a security twist on them. I've been pulled into a lot of different things that uh, you might not expect, like when you join as a security engineer. Uh, and then what's not up here that's mentioned on the right bottom here is communicating what you're doing. Security is hard to measure. It's hard to communicate about what you're doing. And so that's like a big function to a growing security team if you want to continue growing is you have to show that it's working. And uh, that's really challenging as well. So that's a pretty core function. But I didn't put it up here. OK, and then what is a startup? These are crazy buzzwords, so I added more buzzwords just to spice up the slide. Uh, growth and innovation. There is, there is a good reason for each buzzword. Growth and innovation, if your company is not growing, then if it's a startup, uh, you don't want to be there anymore because it's not going to last. Uh, innovation, if you're not doing something new, uh, you probably don't have a startup. It's just selling something that already exists. Agility and pragmatism and AI. Uh, being able to ship things, build products really fast, and go to market really fast and solve problems, both internally on the security team or for your customers. Uh, it's about solving problems. And then responsibility and ownership and next-gen WAFs. Uh, that is, when you're at a small company, you might have the role of five different domains on that big CISO slide, 
and you have ownership over all of them, and it's your responsibility. And so joining a startup is a great way early in your career to get more responsibility than anybody should probably give you. <laughs> um, yeah. OK, security at startups. If you want to be successful at a startup, if you joined one in a security role, I think it breaks down to three core things. Relationships, security culture, and compromise and, uh, and continuous improvement. And what do I mean by these three buzzwords? OK, relationships. When you are on a security team, your customers are all internal, which is different from other parts of the business. The sales team, none of the sales team's customers work at your company. Uh, and so that, it's really nice to have your customers in the same building as you every day because you can talk to them and build, you have a captive audience with your customers, which is Amazon would kill for that. It's uh, really great. You can build really strong relationships with everyone at the company if you approach that uh, that tactfully. And it's also worth noting that your, I think every startup and every company goes through really big security incidents. Your relationships are defined in the times, in your crisis times as well as the good times. So when, when, thing, when shit hits the fan, it's up to you to be the calm person in the room and be the voice of reason on the security team. Uh, so if I have three tips for how to build relationships on the security team, it's uh, really simple. First is smile, even if you're an introvert, and be, uh, be somebody that you'd like to be around. Uh, if you are always on the security team and you're always the bearer of bad news, people will not want to work with you. So building relationships by smiling and being somebody that people want to work with. Uh, and the other piece is at a SaaS company, you want to have an engineering first culture on the security team. And I think this is really different from really large uh, security teams. But if you're not building things, you're not going to have the trust and strong relationships with your engineers who are building the product. Uh, and I mentioned uh, handling hard situations as well as important for relationship building. Um, one thing uh, at Cloudflare, we have a issue, we historically had an issue called Cloudbleed that has a Wikipedia page. And this was a really big bug, and it was really bad. Um, if I came to work with like my face in my hands that day, and I just like sat at my desk, we probably uh, it would have been a lot harder to maintain the trust with like our sales team and the engineering team and things like that. So uh, handling those situations well is really important, and keeping composure. We had a lot of I personally did a lot of calls with customers and sales team, and uh, so I did a lot of calls with our customers and their sales representative that day, and a lot of them went really well because we, uh, we presented the issue, we were honest with our customers, and we smiled, and they couldn't see that on the phone, but we tried to have fun with it. Uh, and a lot of them didn't go well. I got called a lot of words, but <laughs> it was fun, and we, uh, we got through that, and we built strong trust between sales and uh, engineering and security and the entire company. And because of that, that's an event that we have in like our company handbook as a day that really defines Cloudflare. So that's pretty cool. OK, so picture this. I've talked about all these things that uh, you can do to, if you join a startup, how to approach a lot of these, uh, I, I don't think they're very technical things, things that you can do to uh, uh, make joining a startup smooth. This is, this is your startup. I Google imaged a uh, startup. And, <laughs> uh, and we can do this as like a thought exercise where it's like, close your eyes and imagine you're at a startup. But then you can't see the image of the startup. Um, so there's dogs in the office. And uh, they're roaming around, and they're, they're, uh, they're running from desk to desk. And uh, you can imagine cats or raccoons or something if you want. But I think most startups have dogs. 
Uh, and the space is really incredible. The hardwood floors and the brick, all the brick facade. Look at that brick, that exposed brick. Uh, and you're like, why do we have brick in here? We're in a high rise building in downtown. Uh, <laughs> And it turns out the startup before your startup in the space imported the brick from Italy or something ridiculous with all their VC money. Um, and it's super loud in there because it's an open office. Everybody has their headphones and nobody's talking. So you don't know where the noise is coming from. It's ridiculous. Uh, coworkers, everybody's uh, really nice to talk to. Everybody's really smart. They're all great. They're all using like spicy buzzwords like a line and uh, <laughs> They all, uh, they're all referencing technologies you've never heard of, and you have no idea what anybody is talking to. And the co-founder, uh, she started the company in her dorm room and dropped out and recently raised like a bajillion dollars from some really well-respected venture capitalist firms. And she, uh, the co-founder walks up and says to you, I'm so excited you joined. What are you going to do first? And what do you say to that? And you can punt and be like, uh, well, I'll, I'm kind of figuring out what I'm doing here, but I'll have an answer for you next week. And then you walk in next week and she asks you the same thing. Uh, what are you gonna say? And it's uh, like, where do I start as a security engineer? Where do I start, br how do I bring security to this company? Um, when you're faced with this, there's three, I think there's three things to remember, or th there's three important things. You were hired because you were the expert. So w people will listen to you if you want to do something. Uh, you can do whatever you want to, whether it's good for security or not. And you have like almost no internal guidance. You can, I think there's a lot of, especially in Silicon Valley, because of this, there's like a lot of communities of uh, people in startups working together and bouncing ideas off of each other. Uh, so the other important thing to remember is usually security people are hired, the first security person is usually hired a few months after something really bad has happened. And so you might wanna ask, what prompted security now? Uh, so yeah. And then, so when you're approaching answering the co-founder, what are you gonna work on next? Your answer should have, depend on a lot of different things. If you're B2B or B2C, you might have different priorities. Uh, the, the thing that's not on this slide about informing your priorities is your background, like everybody is obviously going to have a different background, whether you're an engineer, whether you come from the compliance side or you're like a super senior manager, uh, this will all, uh, it'll depend what you really prioritize first. But in general, it's like, are you a B2B or B2C customer? Who, uh, company, who are your customers and what do they want from you and the security team? What does good security look like at that company in the future? Uh, Company size, if you're joining really late, if there's 500 engineers and you're the first security engineer, you probably wanna hire people. If you uh, are joining really early, you might prioritize things differently. Customer ba uh, base, if you have, if you're selling scooters to people coming to the conference in LA, you might have different priorities than if you're selling HR software to banks. So th that really matters. Product, if you have a security product versus if you have a different type of product. The uh, I think you have different um, responsibilities. Like I think the security. If you're selling a security product, I think one of the security team's jobs is to make sure you're not selling a sec insecurity product. Things that make you less secure. Uh, velocity of the company. If you guys have a lot. If you guys are shipping things constantly, uh, you might want to make sure that you are also shipping things constantly. And then company culture. Some cultures are really open to security people, some are not, like it all depends. And so, it all depends. Um, okay, so this is kind of what I came up with for Playbook. And based on your background, uh, I would expect 
things that you do, the first things you do, be kind of somewhere here. Uh, and I broke it down into those four domains that I talked about earlier, security, engineering, compliance. I didn't really mention detection and response earlier. It's definitely one of the core, fun uh, core things that a security team does, and then corporate security. And I want to talk about each one and why I put these here. In security engineering, uh, I have four. The first one is SDLC and security design reviews with engineers. This is a really simple way to be in a room with people building your product and work with them towards improving security and meeting them and building trust with them and showing that you're an expert in security. Uh, I've had super different experiences with this, uh, what it looks like and how excited people are to do this. Some people are like, what do you, what do you mean? You want to sit in a room and do a design review with me or read what I plan to build? I didn't even write out a plan. And so there's, there's two ends of the spectrum of people who are really excited about security and have really robust uh, engineering practices and people who like don't really know how to work with you. And so figuring out the right level of how to do a review and, and starting somewhere there is really important. Um, understanding your tech stack by, engineer, uh, with en by engineering. By, by that I mean you should be building things. I think you should be picking things to build that like help your security obviously, but I think building things is a great way to build a strong relationship with engineers when they see that you are an engineer as well if, you, uh, if you're hired as a first security engineer. Uh, and then one of the super important things that I think a security engineering person should dig into is how you manage secrets, API keys, and customer secrets. If you have customer API keys or you have AWS keys laying around, like 80% of security is protecting AWS keys in, in 2019. And so that's probably an area you can have really big impact in a short amount of time by improving that, uh, by just digging into how you manage those, where they are, what they're used for, what the current situation is. And then I put a thing to not do, maybe, at the bottom is bug bounty. I think if you're going to take on a bug bounty really early, you have to understand what you're going to try to get out of it and what the goal and imp for improving, what the goal of the bug bounty is, what you're going to get out of it. Otherwise, it can turn into a lot of work. Uh, but depending on the situation, it can be really good. Detection and response. Um, this is, I have three here. I said four is a total lie, but uh, it's actually like, I guess two of them have three, so three and a half things for each security domain. Detection and response, a big one is a basic incident response plan. And the third one is establishing a communication channel with the rest of the company. I think these two things go hand in hand. Building a way for people to report things to the security team really early is great. And it can be as simple as an email alias. And so, your basic, your basic incident response plan can be a, a lot of the communication channels. The communication channel you establish with the rest of the company will directly feed into your basic incident response plan because people will report things that are incidents almost immediately, especially if you don't have monitoring, detection, or response built out at your company. It's basically just you're around when, when things are on fire. And so, uh, creating a way that people can tell you when things are on fire and then telling people how you handle at a super basic level how you handle things that are on fire is really great. Um, at Cloudflare for years, we had an email alias uh, that people email when they noticed something was broken and when they would email us, uh, we would, all we said is we'll get everybody in a room and we'll deal with it and uh, people, that set expectations. It was plenty for, it was a lightweight process. Everybody understood what could happen if they emailed the email alias and uh, it 
it worked great for a long time. And then we were able, it was basic enough that we could build on it and improve it over time. And then uh, what are the top security signals for your org? Um, if you're all in AWS, like I said, like 90% of security is your AWS keys. And so probably monitoring those pretty early is what you want to do. Uh, maybe you have a big, maybe you have like 100,000 people at your company and corporate, DN, uh, which wouldn't be a startup, or you have a lot of people with computers and they're all installing weird Chrome extensions. I don't know what problems you guys have. DNS might be something you want to monitor in your corporate office, and so that might be something. Uh, or, yeah, so DNR, detection and response and incident response, as you, as you find more things, you'll, uh, as you build out your program more, you'll find more issues and there'll be more work to do. And so keeping a lightweight process that you can build on top of over time is pretty good to do. Compliance, um, so the four, this is the area I have the least experience with. And so if you are a compliance wizard and you hate one of these bullet points, please let me know. Uh, you can, uh, the, I, I have two that are pretty similar. Uh, public facing security docs, like having a security page, a security at um, email alias for people who don't work at your company to report bugs if you're not gonna have a bug bounty. Um, and information about the types of security things that you have done at the company or uh, is, is pretty good. And it usually morphs into policies and procedures and stuff that compliance teams actually uh, do need, especially for, uh, yeah, compliance. Um, a big one is it's not uncommon to join a startup and realize that the sales team or somebody in the business has committed to a compliance goal that is in the very near term and um, yeah, you have commitments for like SOC 2 type 2 and nobody told you uh, when you were, nobody knew that they were signing up for that. And so it's not uncommon to have like weird clauses in enterprise contracts that are, uh, that say you'll do things in unrealistic time frames. And so digging into that is probably a good place to start. And then now GDPR and complying with the laws, if you're uh, like an education company, then there's other laws like COPPA and whatnot, and then GDPR for European privacy, uh, the making sure that your company is in compliance with these laws is, is important. And then finally, on the corporate security side, um, identity and access management is huge. I think that is the, on the same, I think this is also security engineering's job as well. There's a security engineering will own identity and access management in production and then corp, on the corporate side, it's an entirely different story and they're usually, the dream is them converging into the greatest identity and access management solution ever. But uh, that's usually something that, that's usually a f huge win to have that managed on the corp uh, by the security team and to bring it to a company that doesn't have it already. Endpoint, uh, that endpoint protection can be a really, endpoint protection can get harder the longer you wait as you hire more people and it's kind of table stakes for a lot of companies as they grow up, everybody ends up needing endpoint protection. And so that's a good area to start as well. Onboarding and offboarding is a very common place to have problems with at your company, especially at a startup where not everybody knows what the applications that people use on a day-to-day -day basis are and they're not managed in a central place. So how do you remove people from production? How do you remove people's email accounts? How do you make sure they're logged out, how they don't have their email access the day they leave the company? And also, studies show that having a really smooth onboarding process really drastically improves somebody's experience at a company. And so having really smooth onboarding is um, really good. And then workplace security, making sure people, uh, your workplace is safe. The badges are 
uh, bringing badges to the company, bringing, uh, getting people wearing them, and, and uh, making sure that there's procedures and policies for ways that uh, people sign into the office and visitors visit. Um, those are all places that you can have tremendous impact. Um, the one common denominator of all of these is they're, they're meant to be pretty short in scope. You can do most of, you can pretty much do everything on this page in about a quarter. And some stuff like identity and access management on the corporate security side or design reviews, those are always going on. Managing secrets, always going on. But you can get like 95% of the way there in a quarter. And that's the pr pragmatic uh, buzzword that I used earlier. You have to be solving problems and you, there has to be pace behind it. So hopefully this chart, 3.5 things to do is uh, good for you. Okay, personal stories, places I've had success and places I haven't. When I tried to bring security to companies, I worked on this thing called AWS Okta. This was a um, tremendous success when I worked at Segment. What we did was we deleted every engineer's AWS keys that they used on a day-to-day -day basis. They, current, they before that, had all of their AWS keys stored in their keychain using AWS Vault, and we tied their AWS access to their identity provider, and then we dropped in AWS Okta, which they used instead of this AWS Vault tool. It was a huge success because it went really fast. It was really smooth. We got to 100% in about two to three weeks of uh, working on this, and uh, it has a huge impact since deleting keys from engineers means they won't put them on GitHub. Uh, so that was great. Super similar, we built this thing called Chamber for managing secrets. This was a huge failure, uh, which you wouldn't be able to tell by the stars because AWS Okta was a successful one and it has less GitHub stars. It only has 214, and Chamber has 1,000. Uh, you wouldn't know that just by looking at the stars, but Chamber was internally something that we rolled out and it turned into the longest, most drawn out process ever because it's easy to uh, say as a security team, I'll take care of all the secrets. And then you realize that people actually think that you're going to take all of them, store them yourself, own like rotating them, that you're like the owner of all the secrets, and that's not the case. And so setting expectations with people early is helpful. Um, yeah, so I have a bunch of key takeaways for this, but focusing on things you can, you can complete and focusing on the biggest problems are 100% what you wanna do at a, at a startup, otherwise, You'll never make headway, you will never finish anything, and you'll never knock out the big uh, things that you really need to finish. You'll always work on small things like, uh, so focusing on big things that you can finish is what you want to be doing. Uh, avoid taking on things that require lots of upkeep. If you have a bug bounty, bug bounties take a lot of upkeep, so you want to make sure if you're going to have a bug bounty that you by the triaging from the uh, people who manage the bug bounty program. That's a, just an example. You also want to make sure that you are not over committing to design reviews, you're not over committing to code reviews, because those are things that when there's like 50 developers and just one security engineer, you're just going to drown. And then you're never going to be able to focus on actually making security better. The question that I think everybody should be asking at a startup is, how are you more secure this month compared to last month? What did you finish? What is built now that wasn't there a month ago? Uh, because that's what the product teams and the sales teams are asking as well. What's, how's our run rate higher? What's, what have we shipped in the last month? What's our velocity? Uh, and then finally, startups aren't for everyone. Not every company is for everyone. People, I think Leaf today said if you don't have, uh, in his talk, if you don't have executive support, then like you should find a new company. And not every, you might join a startup and 
realize that you're the first security person there for a reason. And so you, it just doesn't work out. So if that happens to you, it's, it's probably not you. It might be them. Might be you, but it, it's probably them. <laughs> um, security company, if you work at a security company, you better be dog fooding your security product. If it's not good enough for the security team, and if it's not good enough for you, it's not good enough for your customers. And that's a great way that you can be a part of the innovation happening at your company. Uh, yeah, don't focus on fancy solutions. Focus on the basics. That's a huge one. If you want to like make sure that all the boot scooters boot up with trusted boot and like secure mod like secure enclave SGX technology, uh, that's probably not what Bird needs right now if you wanted to work at the scooter company that uh, is all around LA right now. So f focus on things that actually have a meaningful and measurable impact instead of just like fun projects that you want to. And keep it simple. Does anybody have any questions? Sure, uh, the question is, do we have SOC 2 and what was hard about it? The answer is uh, the answer is we should have SOC 2 very soon, like this month soon or in the next month. And that's SOC 2 type 1 and not SOC 2 type 2. Uh, and the challenges are, I think Cloudflare actually had a really easier time than most other companies with this because we, because of our size and how much traffic we handle and stuff, we had really robust procedures and things that people just follow because otherwise you could bring down a huge part of the internet. And so a lot of the process and uh, change management stuff that a lot of people struggle with in SOC 2 wasn't what we had trouble with. Um, so I would say the hardest part was just, um, one thing I didn't mention is if there's a certain piece of change that you want to make at a company, it can take a long time. One of the things that we struggled with was just getting everybody on board. Okay, we have to do these small things and chasing everybody down to make sure they get done. And so uh, waiting until everybody was ready to do that was probably the hardest part. Just took time. Any more questions? Uh, I'll repeat again. Uh, so if you, you want to be a security engineer on the project, but that's not your formal role, let's say you're a software engineer, how can you still fulfill that, that role even though it's not what you were hired to do? I think it really depends how you can do that. If you work at a really big company and there's lots of structure and you have really st like strict deliverables you have to work on and you're a software engineer and these are your tickets, um, that's not the type of environment I would want to work in, but it's also not the type of environment you would be able to like work on security stuff on the side. If you work at a company where there's more flexibility and you see opportunity to improve th security things, you can take on that challenge. You can talk with your manager. You can just do it and take it on. Um, it, so I think it depends, but the way you approach it probably matters and the environment probably matters. Yeah. Uh, yeah, basic incident response plan. Do you have kind of like a framework or a flow? Ours that we got by with for years until we were about 700 people was you if you notice something, because we also like, it takes years to build out com comprehensive monitoring and alerting and uh, things that you, most security teams have, um, it takes a long time to build that. And so for years, we didn't have that. And so for years it was, you email us when you notice something's wrong and we will gather the stakeholders and uh, in a room and We'll get everybody on site. We'll escalate with the SREs and uh, who are available to help, and 
will get to a solution together. And just people knowing that we would be there with them the entire time was really helpful and was helpful enough. Um, so no, we didn't we didn't have a we didn't have a super formal process. It was basically like we leaned pretty heavily on our operations process for that already. So our ops team and our reliability team already had like the postmortem process and stuff, and we we would try to stick pretty close to that. But no like escalation, fancy escalation paths, or uh, we didn't really even have an on-call rotation. It was just, uh, you get a hold of us, we'll all get in a room and we'll all, all work on it together. Hey, uh, startups can double and triple in size year over year. Uh, do you have any techniques you employ or strategies to help future-proof your security team for that growth? What do you mean by future-proof the security team? Uh, so uh, just to ensure that the security team can meet the needs of the organization and product teams. I mean, you have everything from incident responders to pen testers to security engineers. Um, I don't know if it's like DevSecOps, like I insert key buzzword. Uh, but is, there, I don't know, is there something unique that you do that helps you uh, scale to, to match the growth of the rest of the company? I don't think there's a magic way to do it. And I think that the, the, the reality is a lot of times you aren't scaling with the rest of the company. And there are new areas that you weren't ready for. And so being able to prioritize and choose which fires that you let burn is super important. You can't, you can't put out every fire, but you sure can pick which ones you, you help with. Yeah. So having worked for some crazy hours in startups, how do you prevent yourself from burning out and manage that, that life balance when they're like, oh, we need you to stay up for 48 hours and fix this? Yeah, burnout's a big topic in uh, startups. I've never experienced uh, it or like even close to it. I like to take time for myself. Um, I, I have like one hour, two days a week that's blocked out on my calendar that I go to the gym and it's like, I have my time, that's all I need, and I'm happy with that. Uh, I know some people have uh, need a lot more, and so you should take vac vacation time, you should unplug, and if you're not at a company that um, is okay with that, then you might wanna look for another company, or you might wanna talk to people there and try to make sure that you're taking time off. Um, usually, if you're feeling a certain way, a lot of other people are too, and so, um, you, I think just taking care of yourself is the big one. And if you're not able to do that, then there's a big problem. So when you're coming into a company and you have you know, all this infrastructure and production and all these assets, how do you kind of like get your head around or how do you take inventory of what already exists, both from like a code level, like review of what kind of vulnerabilities you might already have lurking in the code base and also just how much you have on the internet in terms of like thinking about like attack surface and whatnot? Yeah, the uh, I try to f I I don't know. I have worked really closely with people who know that stuff. It's like at startups, there's usually a few people who like really know where the bodies are buried and what the pro what they have out there, and they'll also tell you what they've done already. They'll tell you oh yeah, I did this thing because of this security reason. And they've thought about security a lot of times, but not necessarily um, at the level that you're going to. And so kind of figuring out where they're at and picking up from there and building trust with those people is so that you can continuously keep asking them and working with them is a, a big one. So um, I think there's like, probably a million different ways you're gonna look for attack surface, but, and all the issues, but uh, like just knowing who to ask is a big one. Cool. Um, you mentioned something about headcount not necessarily scaling with the engineering org. So 
like what are your ideal proportions? Because it kind of varies. I've heard things like 10%. Um, but yeah, I mean, it, it's. I know this is a very contextual question, yeah. but like, also, how do you make that argument to management for the, that security team headcount, and like, what's your ideal ratio? I can tell you what we did. So uh, I've heard as high as 10% at like some companies. Like I think Duo is up there, and there's some more that are pretty high. Um, what we did was we since we have a security product, it was pretty easy for us to begin using our product, working really closely with the product teams and saying, we're innovating. Like we're, we should have the highest growth out of anybody because we know best. We're the first customers of everything. We're the best customers of everything and making that argument. Uh, and then also like producing as well. So uh, working with the product teams, hey, we really need this, uh, being proactive about it. But um, yeah, the the ideal proportions I've heard anything from like two percent is of engineering for apps for specifically AppSec. I've heard um, I've heard ten percent of is just AppSec, which I was like, what? Uh, ten percent? That that'd be nice if you have that many AppSec engineers in the area. But the reality is. Uh, it was a lot easier for us at Cloudflare because of our um, our sec that we're a security product. And then the other piece is um, constantly shipping things and constantly winning. One of the things I didn't talk about a ton, but I mentioned is messaging what you're doing to the world, like your customers in a compliance context, like this is our security packet. But then there's also messaging internally, what we're doing, why we're doing it, who we're working with, and showing that you're getting more secure, and uh, which is super hard. Um, so those are the two ways that I'd approach it. Um, yeah. Do we have any more questions? Go for it. So um, first of all, great outline. Thank you. Hello. Have you had startups that have distributed teams at all? And ha what are some of the challenges you faced in implementing your security plans there? Oh, yeah. So s distributed teams. What are the challenges of distributed teams? So we uh, at Cloudflare, we're not like a remote remote only uh, company. We're, we don't really do remote. We have a strong in-office culture. Uh, and the, But we do have remote offices. We have a really big engineering office in London in Austin and in Singapore. And so we travel, um, we make sure that we get a lot of FaceTime when people are in town. A lot of it, it's relationship building. And then from there, you can work uh, across time zones, like getting up early and stuff. Um, I don't have any like tricks, but it's, it's for us, it's been, you want FaceTime, you want to be over there, you want them to be over here. Um, and like be comfortable working with them and like dealing with the issues of being remote or being being not in the same room. Uh, and getting to know each other really helps, I think, with that. But the we we try to visit uh, our other offices regularly and constantly keep a dialogue with those people. What should we be doing with you while we're while we're visiting you in London? What should we What's coming in Austin? I think it's these three things. Is there anything else that you want to talk about while we're there? And uh, keeping that that always happening with all the people who are uh, remote teams. And I think it'd be harder if we had remote people that were spread out everywhere where we can't like go visit a team. So I'm not sure how I would best approach that. But, um, but the offices, that's what we've done different engineering offices. Any more questions? All right. I'll be around if you'd like to ask questions for the rest of today and tomorrow. Um, I really appreciate you guys spending the last hour with me.